I'm aware I'm the one thing between everybody and lightning talks and a party, so I'm going to get cracking. I had the first talk this morning and the last talk this afternoon. There are a lot more people awake now. So my name's Matt Hamilton uh, from NetSight, and this is a talk on Plone and SharePoint. So first of all, who am I? Um, I've been working with Plone and Zope uh, since 1999. I'm director of a company called NetSight based in the UK. And I've worked on a number of projects in NetSight to do with things like authentication and integration. Um, I get the difficult jobs of talking to other systems and trying to get them to talk back again. So uh, first of all, can I ask here, who here uh, has any contact with SharePoint at all in terms of they either have to use it or they've had to integrate with it or competitively bid against it or have someone else ramming SharePoint down their throats? Right, a few people. Okay, that's why I said ramming SharePoint down their throats. A lot more hands went up. <laughs> I shouldn't be mean to SharePoint. Um, I'll try not to be mean to SharePoint. Areas of integration. So I'm going to talk about three uh, main areas where we're looking to integrate with SharePoint. I suppose first of all what I should say is why. Um, why integrate with SharePoint? So there's certain situations in which you kind of have no choice through either technical or political means that uh, you have to interact with SharePoint. SharePoint actually in terms of things like document management um, is actually pretty good in terms of the way it integrates in with uh, Microsoft Office. There's a lot of people that are used to using it. There's a big ecosystem of add-ons um, and packages, so things like document scanning and various complex workflows and uh, specific um, add-ons for specific industries and things like that. So sometimes it, it, it is uh, needed for things like that. But one of the areas that SharePoint is really not that good at, at least SharePoint 2010, which is what most people will come across. There is 2012, uh, or no, 2013, but most people are still in 2010 or even 2007. SharePoint's not really that good at just general web content type stuff. And I'll, I'll, a bit later on, I'll get onto an example. Some of you may have been in a talk yesterday by my colleague Ben Ackland, which was a case study on uh, the National Health Service and a project we did of an intranet with the National Health Service. And uh, that's where some of this SharePoint stuff, integration stuff has come from and our experience has come from. So three main areas, authentication. So integrating the authentication between Plone and SharePoint. Content, so being able to integrate the content. So serving up SharePoint content within Plone. And search, you've got content in both places. How do you find it? So authentication, I've talked about this a bit on a few other uh, conferences. Uh, there's two particular products that we've created at NetSight to help with this. One is uh, netsite.windowsauth plugin. It's a slight misnomer. It's not just for Windows. It's for any system that uses Kerberos. Uh, so Mac OS, um, Linux, and it can work. Uh, it can run either on a Linux or a Windows server running Plone, and it can work with Safari, Firefox, Chrome, uh, IE. But most people know of it for, for Windows because Windows uses Kerberos under the hood. So that allows you to, uh, well, actually, there we go. Bum, 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 bum. I'll slide about it. On Windows, it uses the internal APIs that Windows have, uh, Windows has for um, authentication, a thing called SSPI. On Unix, it uses the MIT Kerberos libraries. And it transparently logs the users into Plone. So somebody comes in the morning, logs into their desktop with their sort of credentials, and they open up their browser, the browser defaults to their intranet homepage or something, uh, it logs them in transparently. They don't have to type anything more. It's used by, I mean, we use it for the NHS in the UK for an intranet, a uh, global pharmaceutical company for their intranet. Um, several universities use it, and somebody in Brazil, Erico, Argentina, Argentina even, um, it uses it as well. They've uh, implemented it. Installation is relatively easy. Um, you just add the egg in. Uh, well, installation of it in Plone on its own is fairly easy. Uh, there's a number of bits you have to do with the Kerberos setup that inevitably involves talking to somebody at the institution to generate a thing called a key tab file. 
that they need to export and you need to import. There's a few gotchas. If you read through the README for the package, um, I've tried to be as helpful as possible there. Um, there's some weird things to do with, well, Erico found out if the date's incorrectly set, then your Kerberos tickets will be invalid and just the authentication just won't work. And Windows helpfully comes up with his error message. It just says, GSS error, unspecified error occurred. Thanks. Um, so things like that, things like DNS, it's very particular about DNS. Um, that's all mentioned in there, so have a look at that. The other one we wrote recently was a thing called netsite.aspx auth plugin. And again, this runs on various platforms. And what it does is it enables you to encrypt and decrypt the cookie that .NET sites use for sessions. So with Plone, once somebody logs in, there's a cookie that's set called under under AC, and that cookie contains a little cryptographic um, token so that when the user comes back, it knows that this is still this user, it's the same user, we can, we can carry on assuming it's the same user, we don't have to authenticate them again. .NET has the same thing, but it's called something different, ASPX auth and it's a different type of cryptography. But the, the, the point of it is it allows the Plone site and say a SharePoint site to trust each other. So if they're on the same domain name um, or both under a subdomain of the same domain name, then when you go to the SharePoint site and log in, when you then go to Plone, Plone knows who you are and it trusts that you are who the SharePoint server said you were and vice versa. And I did a, a talk running through that as part of a talk on intro to PaaS. The slides are up on SlideShare if you want to uh, find out more about that. The next main area is content. How do we integrate the content between these two? Well, there's several ways. Um, FTP has been around for a long time uh, within SharePoint, um, but it's now, I think, a third-party option. It used to be in included. You could FTP stuff in and out of SharePoint, similar to the way you can do within Zope. And uh, there was a talk from... Um, name escapes me, a uh, Dutch gentleman many years ago uh, at one of the Plone conferences showing how they were FTPing stuff in and out of SharePoint. And then RSS as well. In SharePoint, everything is a list. A list is a bit similar in Plone to our, our collection. And uh, you can export any, any list as an RSS feed, same as you can export collections as an RSS feed. Uh, and you can access stuff like that. But both those ways are not particularly brilliant. Uh, there's a new option now, CMIS. So CMIS stands for the Content Management interoperability specification. It's a standard by the uh, OASIS group. Uh, currently there's a 1.0 was out, now there's 1.1 that just came out last year. And the idea behind CMIS is to provide a common protocol for many different um, uh, content management and document management systems. So it's supported by things like Nuxio, Alfresco, SharePoint, um, IBM's uh, content management system. And a bit more of an explanation. So CMIS provides a common data model covering typed files and folders with generic properties that can be set or read. So you can, um, you can access it via SOAP or via REST. Uh, certain implementations will only implement one or the other and sometimes at differing levels. So the SharePoint one works much better on SOAP than it does on REST, for instance. Not really a surprise there. Um, but it allows you to, to access a repository and, and, and get data down. Now within Plone, uh, we now have a thing called collective.cmis browser. And uh, this was written by Sylvian uh, Violon. I presume I've pronounced that right, probably not, uh, from Infray. And they wrote it to work against Alfresco. The great thing about CMIS is they've written it to work against Alfresco. It was actually fairly uh, trivial to then update that to work with SharePoint. Just have to work around the um, shock horror, slightly different interpretations of a specification by Microsoft. Um, so, uh, but it was actually fairly minor. But in theory, it should be able to work against any CMIS compatible library. And it's used, uh, it was used and funded by uh, LNE and VMM, who are two big environmental departments of the Flemish government. And I guess if you're Flemish, you might know who they are. So installation within Plone. Uh, you need SUDS, which is the uh, SOAP library um, for it. You need Collective CMIS Browser. Uh, for using it against SharePoint, you need the Python NTLM module, because it uses NTLM as a protocol for authentication. NTLM is evil, but it's the only way to do it at the moment with this. It'd be much better to do it with Kerberos, but it's not that possible. Um, 
and uh, suds. Suds is actually annoyingly, um, the release on PyPy is very out of date. There's been a lot of work that's been done since then. So uh, it's on Bitbucket, uh, you get the latest version. And collective.cmis browser, uh, that's the net site um, fork in which we've done the SharePoint stuff in. So eventually that'll be, that'll be rolled back in. We've made some assumptions on that, that you're talking to SharePoint, so it will probably break if you used it against Alfresco again. We need to make things a bit more conditional. So to install it on SharePoint, um, you need SharePoint 2010 or above. Uh, you need what's called the Enterprise Client Access Licenses. So Microsoft licensed SharePoint on a per-user basis, and uh, there are three, three license levels. There's what's called Foundation, which is free. There's a basic one, which costs you a certain amount of money, and there's the enterprise one, which costs you more money. And uh, the enterprise one is what you need. Uh, annoyingly, you have to have all of your users upgraded to the enterprise one um, to, to, to use it, which is expensive, but there we go. Um, you need to install a thing called the administration toolkit on 2010 to give you this um, CMIS uh, package, what's called the CMIS, I think CMIS producer, I think it's called on SharePoint. On SharePoint 2013, I've not tested this, but apparently it's out of the box on 2013. So I'm going to give you a quick demo. Um, has that started? Yes. So this is a um, intranet. Uh, like I said, you may have seen it before. Unfortunately, the um, uh, projector here makes this a little bit difficult to see. But this is a this is a plone site. This is a plone site um, intranet for this NHS organization. And it's got things like, yes, welcome from the chairman, various internal services that they have, general web content stuff. This is where Plone is much better than SharePoint uh, are doing this. So this is just taking you through, just to give you a bit of a flavor as to what's, what's in here. But they also have SharePoint. Now this is SharePoint here. And there are, hard to see, there's four documents there in SharePoint um, listed there. That's the folder contents type view. If you're employing that, would be called folder contents view. That's what SharePoint's view is. Now, what we want to do is we want to get those documents in SharePoint and display them in Plone. So we can go to Add New once we've got the Seamus Browser installed. And we can choose Seamus Browser from the Add New list. And it'll bring up a new Seamus. There's actually a control panel config in which you can set certain um, default parameters as well, because you might add more than one of these things in. Wow, this projector's really wrecking this. Um, I'm adding this, I'm calling it policies, um, I'm putting a description in saying it's policy documents from SharePoint. Um, bum, bum, taking out the body text. There's a URL there, which is a URL to where the CMIS server is, to so where the SharePoint server is. Um, there's the username that I'm connecting as, uh, the password. I'm using NTLM, I'm connecting via SOAP. Uh, I've set the time, the cache to zero minutes because otherwise it'd make this demo hard because it would cache stuff. But you'd normally have that set to something. And I hit save. What you now see here is those three, four documents from SharePoint. They're now displaying in Plone. Go back to SharePoint and uh, back to Plone, you can see there's the same documents on both systems. We can add a new document to SharePoint. So we click Add, add Document, browse for a new document. Um, there's a PowerPoint um, document there about some procedure or process of theirs. That's now there in SharePoint. If we now go back to Plone and hit Reload, it's now there in Plone. And just to prove that it is a real thing, you can click on it. It's got, a, it's got a URL as well. You know, it's a standard URL. It looks like a plone object. You can traverse to it and everything. Um, and when I click open on here, that's the PowerPoint file opened. So that means people can access SharePoint content within Plone without needing to actually physically have access to SharePoint. And they might not even have a, a um, account on SharePoint necessarily because you're using the uh, one particular account to log in and get, get the details. There's a few things that are not quite so great. Um, these things are named after the file name. That's a, that's a big long file name with underscores in it and blah, 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 dot, doc on the end. You know, 
Plone, being nice, will give you a title and you could put a title in and it will give you a nice standard, a nice friendly title and you could fill in a description and that. Uh, you can't really do that on SharePoint. You can put a title in. Uh, it doesn't seem to be exposed via CMS, I'm not sure why, uh, but you can't put as much metadata in easily as you can do within Plone. By default within SharePoint, there's probably add-ons that allow you to do much more. So that's the demo of that. Then the last one is search. So CMIS supports a search API. CMIS's sort of syntax is a bit like SQL. And so you could say something along the lines of um, select all uh, documents of type file um, whose name is like, you know, foo, and it'll bring back all, all documents with, with foo in the title. Uh, so CMIS supports search. Uh, Collective.CMIS browser has an API which exposes this and within the um, Seamus browser API you can connect and you can do a search past the query and you'll get back uh, a collection of documents but the search is not yet integrated into Plone so if you go to the search box in Plone you don't get those things that's uh, something that still needs doing because you can add multiple Seamus browsers objects within Plone um, we'd have to work out what the best way is for when you hit search to display them all. Do you want to display them all? Maybe we have a, a checkbox on the Seamus browser edit page saying include these results in uh, my main site search. And then when somebody does a search in the top search box in Plone, then it searches the Z catalog, but also um, finds any Seamus browser objects and passes the search to them and merges the results. We'd have to work out the best way of displaying those. Um, you know, do we merge them in some sort of order which are more relevant, the ones from SharePoint, the ones from Plone, that sort of thing. So that's that. Obrigado. Any questions? On the Seamus browser, is it a copy of the object or is it a proxy? It's a proxy. We don't copy anything. The data doesn't live in Plone. Um, it just proxies the request through. Um, there's a Seamus uh, document content type and a Seamus folder content type, which basically represent the two constructs that Seamus has. Some, something's either a document or it's a, it's a folder. Um, but I don't believe those are actually persistent. I mean, they, they're just created on traversal. Um, to access it. Yeah. Dylan. Um, so going the other way to make a phone. Uh, <laughs> Damn you. Yeah. So the question was regarding Plone being a Seamus um, producer rather than a Seamus consumer and being able to access content within Plone via Seamus. And yes, that's not really that easy because the syntax that CMIS uses is based upon SQL. So if you have a content management system that is based on an SQL database, it's fairly easy to transliterate between the sort of CMIS query syntax and SQL. What would we do in Plone? Um, because we don't have an SQL syntax. But that's not to say it's not possible because within CMIS you can optionally support certain parts of the specification. You don't have to support all of it. So we could support the notion of being able to retrieve documents but not necessarily searching for them. Or we might be able to search them in a simple case. And so we implement just enough of a construct to say, find me documents with this ID or what's in the name. Whether we want to be able to do things that, like within this name and within this date range and extra criteria or not, I don't know. But um, yeah, we, we could do it. We could do it, and we could do it under, say, a REST API. There was the, um, what was it, WS API for Plone project a while back. Um, might be possible to build on that, I'm not sure. So it could be, could be doable. I've, I've yet to need to scratch that itch, um, basically. But, yeah. 
Yes, it would be a really good tick box. It's it's, it's quite funny. Seamus is a bit of a bit of a funny thing I found because Seamus came about and all these all the analysts went, oh, Seamus, great interoperability and yada yada yada. You must have Seamus. In the next procurement you do, you must make sure your system has Seamus. So all the commercial CMS vendors sort of went out the way and said, oh yes, yes, we support Seamus now. We've brought Seamus out. I mean, actually, the first CMS to support Seamus was an open source CMS. It was Alfresco. So you know, good on open source. Um, but Within Plone, it's kind of like, well, we've had FTP, we've had WebDAV for ages. You know, if you wanted to get content out of Plone, why wouldn't you just use WebDAV? You know, we've we've had a way to solve that particular problem for for quite a while. Um, but Seamus would mean you could use a standard tool. You could use a you could download a Seamus browser um, application on your desktop or maybe on your phone and access a Seamus site and get the content. So you could download documents from Plone or from SharePoint or from Alfresco or from Nuxio. You wouldn't have to know what the system is. You just have to know what address to, to point it at. So yeah, it would be good. Any other questions? And again, Dylan. So what are the top three reasons to go for Plone rather than SharePoint? For a public website, you say? Cost. So I mentioned about SharePoint, about you have the um, client access licenses. If you want to expose a SharePoint site to the outside world, that's an extra 20,000 pounds, euros, dollars, um, just to do that. So if you want the outside world to see your site, you know, fork over the money um, just to do that. So that's one thing. Two, SharePoint doesn't really give you much out of the box. You re it's really quite basic. Um, so to do anything interesting, you generally have to buy additional licenses to third-party products. Again, more money. Um, and it's not that flexible in terms of uh, the layout, you know, trying to theme it and make it look, I mean, you know, people might have said theming Plone is difficult. Yeah, try SharePoint. Um, their standard kind of uh, mechanism for doing sort of changes to the, to the look and feel is, to create what in Plone we would call a portlet, they call a web part, um, fill it with jQuery, and hide it. So it renders this portlet it, you know, hidden in the background that then switches off this other bit of UI and moves this bit around, and that's, that's the way of, of customising SharePoint mainly. So um, yeah, really co sort of cost and flexibility, are, I, I would say the two, the, the, the two main reasons not to go for it. It's, it's a, it's a big thing and it's generally we find implemented by IT departments because their response is the answer is SharePoint, what was the question? And so for, for IT departments it's easy, you know, they've got a, you know, oh, hey it's a Microsoft product, we just, you know, pull some levers and press some buttons and ta-da, um, but with no real consideration for what the user wants to do. This is not everybody, but this is the majority of times we see it's deployed, and that's why a lot of people are not very happy with it, because it was put in without any consultation to what their actual requirements were, and hence it doesn't fit them. So, um, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, Matt. Exactly. Yeah. So use, yeah, exactly. So use them both. I mean, that's why we started doing this because it's a case of, it, it is a big beast to try and kill and it has a lot of political weight behind it normally within organizations. So we found the better way is rather than kill it to give it a cuddle instead and uh, try and get content out of it. Um, and that's, that's, you know, that's not just us. I mean, we know, um, an, another company based in Bristol, the same sort of age and size as NetSite, but they do all Microsoft stuff, we do all open source stuff. Um, and they do some SharePoint stuff, but they don't ever really use SharePoint. They often use SharePoint as just a back end, and then they write their whole front end to hide SharePoint, and they just access it and, and pull some bits and pieces out of it. So even they, in many cases, don't really use it. They just try and use it as part of a, a wider system. So yeah, that's that's kind of what we're trying to do here is to sort of use use both to their advantages, really. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. 
So one one really big advantage of SharePoint is its integration with Microsoft Office. That's its that's its killer feature. Um, you can open a document within SharePoint, open it directly within Word, hit save, and it goes back in. I mean, okay, we've had the um, somebody remind me the name of the plone. No, no, not the not the Enfold. Well, yes, yeah, so there is the Enfold one. There's Enfold Desktop that did the same thing, but there was the um, external editor. That's what I'm thinking of. External editor within Plone that could do a similar thing, but you know, the SharePoint one is just that much slicker because it's, you know, the same company that built the operating system has built the document management system has built the piece of software you're, you're writing your, your document in. So, um, yeah, it is very good. And things like when you open it within Word, you've got access to metadata directly within Word and version control directly within Word. So in that regards, it's, um, it's, uh, it's pretty good. But, I mean, Alfresco, for instance, can do the same thing. Um, Alfresco basically sort of reverse engineered the sort of SharePoint protocol and bits of web dev and stuff that it used so that you could actually put SharePoint in and pretend, uh, put Alfresco in and pretend it was a SharePoint server. And your, you know, Microsoft Word still thinks it's talking to SharePoint when in fact it's talking to Alfresco. But CMIS should obliviate that in the end. I mean, it should be a, hopefully that the integration between Microsoft Word, say, and SharePoint is over CMIS. Uh, I don't know if Microsoft will go there, but um, why? Yeah, exactly. Why? Why? Yeah, embrace and extend. So just, just on the same point, do you think there's any benefit on uh, implementing that API, that Microsoft API? I think it's not quite yet a reverse engineer. I think it's a published API. Maybe. Um, again, it comes down to how many people are asking for it. You know, it'd be a great tick box, but I'd probably say just go and use Alfresco instead. Um, yeah, I mean, you could use you could use Alfresco, and you could use the the CMS stuff. I mean, I think that's what Infra are using it for. So you could probably have Word thinking it's talking to SharePoint when it's actually talking to Alfresco, save to Alfresco, and Plone then looking at Alfresco via the CMS con uh, CMS browser and pulling data out and presenting it. Ben. Yeah, so the question was when, when somebody goes, accesses via the Seamus browser, it uses one set of credentials that are saved in the Plone site rather than the credentials of the user that's browsing it. Um, could you reuse them? Possibly. Um, it depends on the authentication method being used. So, um, if, so if they're accessing Plone, um, they would have to be supplying credentials in a way that we could reuse against SharePoint. So it depends what mechanism they're using for SharePoint. If they're using, say, basic auth on SharePoint, and you're using basic auth on Plone, i.e. the you know, username and password type thing, you could take the username and password, you could possibly inject it into the request to SharePoint, you'd be okay. If they're using like Windows integrated authentication stuff that I showed earlier, then you've actually got a Kerberos ticket, and you would have to then pass that Kerberos ticket back and you then need what's called a delegated ticket. Basically, within Kerberos, you can get a ticket to pretend to be another user on their behalf. Um, they use it a lot within, say, um, IIS talking to uh, Microsoft SQL Server. So when a web, web browser goes to SQL Server and they've authenticated, it uses their credentials to pass those onto the database uh, so that they can respect the user level database permissions on the database. So yes, if you could do that, it would be great. It'd be good next step, I think, to be able to do that. Sometimes you might not want that. Sometimes you specifically would not want to do that because you don't actually have those users in SharePoint. Uh, and you don't want them because maybe if you do that, somebody might ask you for licenses. Um, so, yeah, um, it, would be, it would be a good next step to look at, certainly. Any other questions? No? Great. Thank you very much. Obrigado. So I think now we have lightning talks, I believe. In the main room? In the big room, lightning talks. <laughs>